1 Peter chapter 5, and uh, we're going to cover one verse, verse 1. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. We've already had three people online pray to give their lives to Christ today. Uh, God's already spoken. We've got all the wind shape group. Now here, let's give it up for them today. Thank the Lord they're here. Pray for this week. It's going to be a great week. Um, and in fact, what, talking about wind shape is here. We had VBS, what was it, two weeks ago or something like that. On my way in, I was thinking about a song that I learned as a boy in VBS, thinking about the people that Peter was writing to. When you come to 1 Peter, most of you know this, but let me catch everybody up. Peter is writing to, this is the only epistle written to a region and not specifically to a church like the church at Rome or the church in Philippi or the church in Ephesus. This is written to believers across Asia Minor who are in the midst of tremendous persecution. They're suffering. Uh, they've been ostracized by their families. Uh, they've been turned out by their friends. They've been cut off by all of their relatives. Uh, the government now is turning more and more against those who profess Jesus Christ. There's pressure that's coming from the government, from the society, from family, from the community. And they're not thinking very well. They're not handling it well at all. And in fact, they're using very poor judgment. When you're under pressure, listen, if you've not settled the issues in your life uh, before real genuine oppression and persecution comes, you don't think well through it. And so many of them were saying, well, listen, maybe we were just never saved to begin with. And others were saying, well, maybe we were saved, but we've lost our salvation. And others were saying, well, maybe God just absolutely has withdrawn his spirit from us and Jesus Christ uh, doesn't care for us. And Peter writes them and he says, you remember back in chapter four, he's writing them and he says, listen, you need to stop questioning why all these fiery trials are coming on you and you need to understand that happens when you profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I want you to listen to Spurgeon. Spurgeon said this, do you expect to be honored in the world where your Lord was crucified? You should expect that the world, listen, we don't get along with the world because the world wants us to run into sin with them. He's already said that in chapter two, and we don't do that, and the world resents it. And so all these Christians are going through this tremendous persecution and pressure and struggle and difficulty, and they're wondering why. And Peter comes and he says, listen, you need to understand, this happens. What do you do? Look at the last verse of chapter 4. The last verse of chapter 4, verse 19, he says, because you're going through all of this, therefore, what is the therefore, therefore? It is therefore, it's reflecting back on what he's just said. Because you're going through this persecution, those who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator and doing what is right. He says you keep doing what is the right thing, entrusting yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's struggle. Does it hurt? Yes. Is it painful? Yes. Is it difficult? Yes. All of that's true, but in the midst of that, what do I do? I keep living for Jesus Christ. Now, he says that. Now, watch it, what he does. He comes chapter 5, verse 1. By the way, none of these chapter and verses were in the original. Uh, that's all added later for help. So he turns around, and the second thing he says, therefore. He comes to another there. you got two therefores back together. Therefore, because you're suffering, you just keep entrusting yourself to Christ. How do I know I'm doing that? Because I'm doing what is right. I'm living out his word for my life. Therefore, now, he's going to turn to another group. And the group that he's going to turn to are the presbyteroi, the elders, the shepherds. He's going to turn to the pastors, and he's going to say something to the pastors. Now, here is Peter, who is an under-shepherd, and he turns to shepherds, he turns to pastors, and he says to the pastors, when your people are going through difficult days, when they're going through struggles, when they're hurting, when they're in a time of chaos and confusion, you do this. Look at verse 2. Here's the main verb in this pericope right here, shepherd the flock of God among you. That's what you do. You shepherd them. 
So watch it what he says now, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the suffering of Christ and partaker also of the glory that is to come to be revealed, shepherd, poimain. Those, there are three words in the New Testament for pastor, presbyteroi, elder. The elder was an older man in the Jewish congregation who would do what? He would do what Peter's just said in verse 2. He would help shepherd the congregation. He would help shepherd those people. Poimain is another word for pastor. It means shepherd. And then you have episkopos, the overseer, one who oversees. A pastor is not a dictator. He's an overseer. He doesn't dictate what goes on. He oversees what goes on. So here he uses two of the three words for pastor in the New Testament. And he says, listen, when your people are going through a struggle, when they're going through a difficult time, what is the pastor to do? What are the elders to do? Shepherd the people. By the way, let me tell you, you say, well, okay, well, this lets me out. I'm, gonna be, I'm preaching to me today. You get to hear, and you say, I, I, I either skip over this, and y'all all sit there and think, well, this was for the preacher, and he just didn't deal with it. Uh, I have to talk about me today, what God's word has to say to me as a pastor, what it instructs me to do. This is a word because Peter's looking at them, and he's saying, this is what you pastors do when your people are hurt. You shepherd these people. Shepherd them through this difficulty, this struggle, this hurt, uh, this difficult time that they're facing. And he says, you shepherd them because they're like sheep. Now, all through the word of God, you find that. Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Amos. You go through all of the Old Testament, and you see this continuously as the people of God are referred to as a flock of sheep. You get to the New Testament. Jesus does it. He talks about my sheep know my name. He's talking about his people. He's talking about those who've trusted in him. He compares them to sheep. Peter does it right here. Paul will do it in other places. But the people of God are often. Now, what is it about sheep? Now, I'm going to give you a long introduction today because I'm setting this. I'm going to deal with the first verse. Next Sunday, I come back and deal with verse 2, 3, 4, and 5. So I want to give you an introduction into this. This is what is implied when he says shepherd. A number of things that I want you to see. It's implicit in the text, although it may not be explicit in the text. It's implied. What is he saying? Well, sheep need to be shepherded. So what do sheep need? There are three basic things that he's talking about, the concept here. Number one is provision. Sheep need provision. That is, they need a shepherd to lead them into green pastures. Remember what David said, Psalm 23, sheep need this. They need this provision because sheep do not have a discriminating taste. They'll eat anything, bitter weed, milk weed, stuff that will make them sick. Most animals have a discriminating taste. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I'm almost hesitant to tell you. My wife will fix an egg and some sausage for those dogs in the morning. But now this is what she does. She doesn't eat regular eggs or regular sausage. It's got to be turkey sausage, and it has to be egg beaters. Well, none of that is food to me. That's not, that's not what God intended. <laughs> so I get a regular egg, and I get, I get the hog. I, I eat the pork. Well, one of those dogs will eat that fake egg and false heretical sausage. <laughs> the other dog won't. So there's one dog in the house that has discriminating taste. The other dog does not. Sheep don't. They'll eat anything, which begins to be a problem. It makes them sick. And then you've got a whole nother issue that I'm not about to go into when it comes to sheep. But Sheep don't know what. So they've got to have someone that leads them into a pasture. That's what David is saying in Psalm 23. He leads me into green pastures. And he's saying he leads me to a place where there's not only food, but there's the right kind of food to eat. Now, that's going to come up next week. I'll look at that next week. Now, by the way, let me just stop right here and say, do you know where, do you, do you ever stop and think where Peter is getting this from? Anything in Peter's background that, leads him to say this, to say you need to shepherd the people of God. Take your Bibles and go to John chapter 21. You know the passage very well. John chapter 21, where Jesus has now been resurrected. 
He's appeared several times to the disciples. Peter now turns in almost in frustration, looks at the other disciples and, you know, Jesus isn't here. We've seen him a time or two, but he's not here. What am I to do? I don't understand what I'm to do. I'm going to do the only thing I know to do. I'm going back fishing. And so Peter goes back to fishing. One night, they're out on the sea, and they're fishing all night. And what happens? Not a cotton-picking thing. Because that's always what happens when they fish. They never catch fish. How do these people live? As professional fish, you never see them catch fish until Jesus shows up. The next morning, they see a figure on the shore. Jesus calls out to them and says, you don't have any fish, do you? Children, you don't have any fish, do you? He knew. He knew because they never caught fish. And so he tells them what to do. They catch that haul of fish, and they bring it in. And by the way, when they bring it in, Jesus already has fish there frying for them. And as he's frying these fish for them, What does he do? He says, bring what you have and put it in with mine. Now, listen, here's just a side note in the sermon. This is just a footnote. The footnote is this. Jesus doesn't need what you've got. He doesn't need it. But he does give you the opportunity to bring the little that he's allowed you to make and put it in with his so it looks really good to you. And so they eat breakfast. And from breakfast, Jesus turns now to Peter, and he looks at him. Peter, as you remember, who's denied Christ now three times. He turns to Peter, and he looks at him, and he says, Peter, do do you love me more than all of these here? you love me more than the rest of the guys that are here? I I don't know. Scripture doesn't say, but I, I can just imagine Peter looked down. And I imagine he looked at that fire and it reminded him of the fire that he was sitting by when he denied Christ three times. And I suppose that he looked at that and answered, Lord, you know that I do. I wonder if he looked at Christ. I wonder if he was too embarrassed to look at him. But he said, Lord, you know that I do. And in his heart, he did. Now listen to what Jesus said. He said this specifically, tend my Lambs, not sheep, but specifically little sheep, lambs. Tend, bosco in the Greek, feed. Present active imperative. It's a command, it's an imperative. The present active tense is this feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed and feed and feed and feed and feed. You begin to feed and you keep feeding. And he says, Feed my sheep, feed my sheep. So now here's Peter, years later, looking at the church under pressure under persecution, under hardship, and he looks at the pastors, and he's going to say to the pastors exactly what Jesus had said to him, go shepherd these people. Shepherd the sheep. You go take care of them. You get out there, and you minister to them, and part of that means you take them to where you can give them good food. You feed them the right thing next week. The other thing is this, sheep not only need help finding good food, they need help finding water. You know, a horse has a sense of moisture. A horse can sense and smell moisture in the air. So can a cow. So can a dog. Most animals can't. Sheep can't. Sheep can stand yards away from a pool of water and die of thirst. They can't smell the the moisture in the air. They can't sense the moisture. They don't have that sense. They don't have that ability. So that's why, listen, David says, he leads me beside still waters. Now, they not only have to be led to water. You have to lead a sheep to water. They don't have enough sense to get there on their own. So they have to be led to that water. And you have to be careful that it's still waters. It has to be fresh. That means generally moving But they have to block off a place for for sheep to get out because these sheep will get down into the water. Their wool gets wet and they sink like a rock. So they have to be led. They need provision. Every sheep, every congregation needs provision. But the second thing they've got to have is protection. Sheep have no natural means of defense whatsoever. I've said this before. You know what a sheep is without a shepherd? A snack. 
They have no means. Their little mouths, they can't really bite anything. They can't, what are they going to do with those little tiny feet of theirs? They can't stomp a claw or kick or fight or they can't do anything. They're helpless. They have to have protection. Do you know if a predator ran into this flock of sheep right here? You know what these sheep would do? You would think, well, they'll all run off in every direction. No, they won't. Sheep all run together. When they're under threat, they all run together. It's as if to say to the predator, here, can we make it easier for you? Here's your buffet. Just chomp away on all of us. That's what they do. They don't run apart. They don't get away. They all clump up together. And so they've got to have somebody that is there to protect them. David talks about that. He talks about the protection that he gave his father's sheep. Here, Peter is talking about this very thing, and that is congregations need protection. People, God's people need to be protected. Let me give you something from MacArthur. Watch, listen to this. John MacArthur gives an interesting insight here, and he says, sheep are more vulnerable to injury than any other animal because they're so humble. They're so humble in their spirit. Their attitude is such a meek attitude. They give up. They just roll over. If you hurt sheep, he is so easily offended or she is so easily broken in spirit, says these shepherds, that they will completely be crushed by the pain and hurt and they lack a self-preservation instinct. They have no instinct that says, fight for your life. Sheep don't have that. They have no will to fight. They have no will to struggle to live. So they just give up and die. Do you know I've known folks like that in the church? I've known folks like that that I've grieved over through the years who've been hurt. And in their hurt, do you know what they do? They withdraw. They have no, def they have no sense of, you know what, I have to trust Christ. They just abandon the flock. They abandon the church of God. They abandon the word of God. They abandon the Lord himself. And they go off and in their own misery, they simply sit there until they just die spiritually. They hurt themselves to death, honestly. Peter comes and he says, there's so many of you in the fellowship of God. I know that every time I stand up and preach, I think through this, it is uppermost in my mind that there are people listening to me preach that are so wounded and so deeply hurt that the day may be the last day they ever walk through the door of a church. And they will not let me help. They will not give anybody the opportunity to shepherd them. And not only that, but do you know sheep are a danger to themselves? You see them standing on that hillside there. Sheep easily tip over. You, you've, you've all heard about tipping cows. Well, sheep really do this. They, they fall over. And they cannot get back up. They just fall over and they sit there and flail away. And if somebody doesn't come and roll them back over and stand, and you just can't take, if a sheep rolls over and he's just sitting there, all the blood rushes quickly from those little legs. That's why a shepherd will go and pick a sheep up and hold him up until the blood rushes back down into those extremities, and then he'll set him down on the ground. You're a danger to yourself. <laughs> you need a shepherd who will protect you, who will be there for you, who will care for you. That's what Peter is saying to these pastors of all these hurting people. He says, listen, you need to go and shepherd them. Make provision. Give them provision. Give them protection. But number three, give them direction. Sheep have no sense of direction. These sheep probably were born right in here, probably right close to these trees right in here. That's why they're right there. That's the pasture they know. If they got 50 yards over that hill, they'd be lost. And you know they have no sense of direction. Their eyesight is horrible. They can't see very far in front of themselves, but they have no sense of direction. Now listen, you read all the time, family goes to Minnesota, vacations on the lakes, loses the family dog, they come home brokenhearted. A year later, the dog walks up in the driveway in Alabama. <laughs> Sheep don't do that. Sheep can be 50 yards from the house and never know which direction home is. They wander. They get lost easily. They need that protection and they need that direction. That's why Isaiah says, 
All we like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way. It, let, let, me, let me tell you something. It comes so naturally for a sheep to wander. It comes so naturally for me to walk off into sin. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I can tell you about me. It just, it, it's easy for me to sin. I don't have to think long and hard about it. If I'm not going to, that's when I've got to get down and wrestle the thing down. I'm like a sheep. I'll wander off in the wrong direction very quickly. Now, that's what he says. He says, this is what sheep need. You go and you shepherd. He calls to the presbyteroi, and he says to the elders, he says to the pastors, he says to the shepherds, you go and you shepherd because they have these needs. But then he comes and he says something else. You need to understand what your duty is in all of this. That's why he uses that phrase, you shepherd the flock of God among you. Well, what does that mean? What is he saying with that? Well, let me give you a couple of things. Number one, what he's saying is this, is that you have to be with sheep. You, I can't pastor people from Zoom. You can't pastor people at a distance. You can't lead sheep at a distance. You have to actually be with the people if you're going to lead the people. You have to be there with them. In fact, you say, when a pastor, why are you making such a big deal of this? Because it's the next passage to preach in this chapter, and I wanted to deal with it. Honestly, I needed to hear it for my own personal self. Listen to what Solomon says in Proverbs 27, verse 23. Know well the condition of your flocks. You can't know the condition of your flocks if you're not with the flock. I don't breeze in and out of here. I don't come in, preach, and leave, and I'm gone. You never see me again. He comes and he says, here, you pay attention to your herds. You can't pay attention to them if you're not there with them. Listen to what the psalmist, listen to what the musician who was under David said about David. Now, David doesn't say this of himself, but in Psalm 78, verse 72, the psalmist or the musician who wrote this psalm, said this about David. So he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart, and he guided them with the skillfulness of his hand. If you're going to guide something, you have to be there with him or with her. You've got to be there. That's what he's saying. Jesus gives an interesting, there's an interesting parable. I I just looked at this this week for whatever reason, but Look with me at Luke chapter 12. Jesus gives a, it's a fascinating parable. Sounds almost like the parable of the, of the virgins in Matthew chapter 25, but this is a parable about servants being ready. They're dressed and in readiness. Keep your lamps lit. Luke chapter 12, verse 35. Be dressed in readiness. Keep your lamps lit. lit. Be like men who are waiting for their master who uh, returns from the wedding feast so that they may immediately open the door to him uh, when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master will find on the alert uh, when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will gird himself to serve and have them recline at the table and will come up and wait on them. Now, it's an interesting parable Jesus is giving there, but I want you to look at Peter's response. I am convinced Peter was a Baptist, and here's another reason why. This is exactly what Baptists say. Are you talking to me in this sermon or is that about somebody else? That's what he says. Look, if you got a Bible, you'll see it right here. Luke chapter 12, verse 41, Peter said, Lord, are you addressing this parable to us or to everyone else? You talking to me? Are you you telling this to me? Or did you mean this for him? Surely you don't mean, listen, this is for all of us. For all of us. Now listen to what Jesus said. He's going to talk about the guy or the girl who is ready to serve. They're ready. Who then is the faithful and sensible steward whom his master will put in charge of his servants so that he gives them their rations at the proper time? Jesus said, who is the guy that God is going to tap or the girl, the lady, the man, the lady, that God is going to tap to feed his people? The one who is ready. That's an amazing statement to me. God has given you one to feed you. That is me. I'm to be careful what I feed you. 
that every bit of it comes out of this right here and not out of something else. I'm to protect you from anybody who would feed you anything but this. And I'm to give you direction by this. And God's given that responsibility to me, and he's given it responsibility to others. Peter looks at the shepherds, and he says, you go and you shepherd these people in difficult days when they're struggling. It's a snap to pastor y'all in easy days. Last year was murderous. <laughs> it was beyond hard. It was beyond difficult. How in the world do you pastor sheep when you can't get to the sheep? It's easy in a day like today. Today's easy. But there are times when you're struggling and you're going through difficulty when it's difficult. And he's saying to these shepherds, if you're going to shepherd, you have to be there. I had a good friend of mine, Dr. Brent Taylor, sent me. He wrote two books published this year. One is called Founding Leadership and the other is called Presidential Leadership, both excellent books. Uh, he teaches leadership at Dallas Baptist University. He's a pastor there in, in the city of Dallas. And he sent me, I opened the first one in the, in the uh, Founding Leadership. I opened the first chapter and I started reading. And he had, he had a quote by Washington that I had forgotten, read it last night, and I thought, gosh, this is so good. I want you to listen to what Washington. In, 19, in 1756, to his officers of his Virginia regiment, Washington spoke to them, and he said, remember that it is the actions of a man, not the commission, that reveals him to be an officer. Let me say that again. It is the actions of the man, not the commission, that reveals him to be an officer. It is not your title. Washington goes on to say, and we expect more of the man than just the title. Now, a lot of people love to run around the church and fling a title around. Let me tell you what, your title does nobody any good. What does them good is when you shepherd people. When you shepherd the people that God has given to you. And Peter stands and he calls and he says, listen, you've got to be with the people if you're going to shepherd them. Let me give you the others very quickly. Number two, the second thing is this, keep the sheep from getting lost. Sheep and people get lost very easily. Keep them from getting lost. Keep them from wandering away. Sheep wander off. You know why? Why do sheep, what did you see these sheep doing up here? Did you see any one of them stick their head up and look around to see what was going on? They've all got their head down. Now, let me show you. Same way with people. We've got our head down just like this. Right here, like this, constantly. We never see anything out, out there anymore. Why? We've got a head. It's easy to wander away from God. It's easy to wander away from the flock. It's easy to wander away from the church. It's easy to wander away from the word of God. It doesn't take a lot of effort at all. It comes easy. He says that we're to shepherd them by keeping you from wandering away. Number four, to encourage the wounded, to encourage the sick, to encourage the hurting, to encourage the afflicted, to pick them up, to hold them up, to help them up. And number five, to defend the sheep. I come back to that. Look at what Peter says in this chapter context when he says shepherd the, the sheep, the flock of God. He says do it because... There is a lion that is prowling and he's roaring and he's seeking someone to devour. Satan would love nothing better than to get into the midst of Valleydale Church. He would love nothing better than to get into here and destroy the fellowship, to destroy the unity, to destroy the mission process that we've got going. Satan would love nothing better than to destroy the feelings that we have for one another. You have to be on the alert. I have to watch it. You have to watch it. The elders have to watch it. The deacons have to watch it. And I have to watch you. Because as I've already stated, you'll tend to wander off. Part of what God gives a pastor to do is to come to you if he sees 
something wrong in your life. If I see something in your life that I feel like, now that's, that's not healthy for you spiritually. It's not good for you personally. I, I'm to come and to look at you and say, listen, I just want to sit down and tell you I care for you. And what I see you wandering off into and w- the direction you're going is not good. It's not healthy for you. And you know how that's generally received? You get mad because somebody cares for your soul. And you get upset. But if I see it, I'm going to do it. So just get mad now and get over with it. But that's what he's saying. That's what it means to shepherd. That's what it means to be a presbyteros, to be an elder, is that you shepherd the people of God. And when you see them headed in a wrong direction, you go and you at least confront them with what's going on in their lives. Do you know what that is, folks? That's called love. That's called shepherding. You might call it interference, but I call it what God's called me to do. Now, that's all introduction, and I've got three and a half minutes left. I'm going to preach the verse before we leave. I'm going to get this done. So let me just take you to the verse. Now, listen, because God's called me as a leader, and he calls me to call leaders to shepherd this flock. And Peter comes and look at three things that he says. Number one, He says, I make this identification with you. Listen to what he says. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder. That's soon presbyteroi. That is fellow elder. It literally means with the elders. I am part of the elders. I am part of you. Peter is saying, I identify with you. I'm one of you. I'm not different than you. I'm not more special than you. I'm not better than you. I'm one of you. I've been dealing with Anabaptists. If the Anabaptists were not already killed out, I think I'd kill one of them. Uh, I finished this last Wednesday night at 8.30 this past. I finished my last chapter for my dissertation, and I sent it off to the editor. Fell in the floor, passed out for the next two hours. Anyway, um, let me tell you what the Anabaptists did. The Anabaptists did this. They looked at the magisterial reformers, and the radical reformers said, we're, no robes for us. No robes for us. We're not putting on robes. Um, We dress as the people. And so they dressed as the people. And then they came and they said, no Latin for us. And they were all well-trained. Hubmeyer was well-trained in Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. Well-trained in Latin, spoke in Latin, wrote in Latin a great deal. Said, when I preach, I preach in the vernacular of the people. I preach in German. That's what he preached in. So that the people understood. And then they said, no lectionary for us. We're not following the lectionary of church tradition and church councils and uh, the early church fathers. We're not following that. We pick up the word of God and we preach the word of God. That's what the people need. And then they came to the service of the church and they said, no, we will not dispense the elements of uh, the Lord's table. Uh, The lay people will be a part of that. And so the lay people came and they served the people. They involved the people. Do Do you know that the Anabaptists had what they called a congregational hermeneutic? Do you know what that is? Read my dissertation, you'll see. No, Uh, it, it it was this. It was that they gave the opportunity to the congregation to comment on the passage being preached. I'm waiting on you. You know why? Because they said, we're one of you. We're interested to hear what you think the Word of God says. We want to know that you've been in the Word of God and the Word of God has changed your life and we're anxious to hear how the Word of God has applied to your life and how you're living it out. Peter comes and he says, just exactly. These Anabaptists say what Peter was saying. We're one of you. I make an identification. I live where you live. I eat in the places you eat. I dress like you dress. I don't have a towel. Do you know how hard that is for me? And yet I knew I was preaching this today, so I had to be one of you. (laughs) The second thing is this. There's an attestation that's here. Look at this. Listen to what he says. He says, not only am I your fellow elder, I'm a witness of the sufferings of Christ. Now, we know that Peter was there in the courtyard of Caiaphas while Christ was on trial. John was there as well. But Peter was not there at the cross. We're given no account that he was there at the cross when Christ died. John was, not Peter. 
But he says, I am a witness of the sufferings of Christ. What does he mean by that? Marturos is the word in the Greek for witness. It gives us our word martyr. How in the world do you get from the word witness to somebody who's put to death? Because every time they would witness in the first and the second and the third Christian century, every time they would witness of their life to Jesus Christ, they were put to death. So the word marturos became witness who is put to death. Give a testimony, die. Witness to Christ, that's what he's saying here. He's saying, I am a witness to the fact that Jesus Christ suffered for the sins of this world. Go read Acts chapter 2 in the sermon of Peter there. He says, I am a witness to this. I bear witness to the fact Jesus Christ is Lord. He died for your sins, whoever you are. And if you'll repent, you'll be forgiven of those sins. He says, I witness to that. Every one of us in this place are to be a witness to the sufferings of Christ. But then look at this last thing. It's a revelation. Now listen to what he says. He's talking about shepherding, serving other people, serving other people. And he says, a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. We don't know what we're going to be when Jesus comes back, but we know that when Jesus comes back, we're going to be made like him. He's talking about, he says that when I serve and when you serve one another, he says we're not only giving glory to God, but we become partakers of the glory of God. Jiminy Cricket. Do you hear that? Do you grasp what he's saying? Now you say, How, what is he talking about? Where does he get that? Now listen, does he go to anything where he saw the glory of God? Yes. You go to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. He said, for when he received honor, speaking of Jesus, and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased, and we ourselves, Peter, James, John, we ourselves, they were on the mountain with him, heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Peter says we were there, and all of a sudden, out of the humanity of Christ, burst the divinity of God. There was the glory of God shining to the point to where it was like staring into the sun. We had to look down. We couldn't see it. And we basked there in the glory of Jesus Christ and it splashed over onto us. It did that to Moses when he was on the mountain with God and in the presence of the glory of God so that when he came down, his face shone. People were terrified because of the glow of the glory of God on the face of Moses. He says, when you're serving somebody, he says, you're partaking of the glory that is going to be revealed in the second coming of Christ. You are never closer to your resurrected body than when you are serving your brothers and sisters in Christ. Did you, that's what he's saying right there. That in that you're giving glory to God and the glory that you're giving to God by serving others, it splashes back onto you. I talked to a guy this week, pastor in Broken Era. Oklahoma, Arab Baptist Church. He got a great name. His name is Andy Taylor. Um, I talked to him back and forth in a private conversation because he had shared a story that I asked him about. He's got a 22-year-old son by the name of Seth. Seth is a special needs adult. He has um, he is autistic and he's nonverbal. There he is standing. That's Seth standing up. He goes to special school for special adults, and that's Jake. Jake is his good friend. And Seth's job at school is to push Jake. Jake can't walk, and Jake can't hear. And uh, Seth's job is to push Jake around to wherever they're going in school and to help Jake do whatever needs to get done at school. So Andy wrote the other night, and he said, we went out for a family walk, and Seth was with us. 
And uh, he said, as we was walking, Seth started to cry, just started to cry, and it wouldn't stop. He said, we couldn't console him. We couldn't find out, Seth, what's wrong? Are you hurting? Is something wrong? Tell us what's going on. And he said, when they got back to the house, uh, Seth went and began to spell out some things. He's a very smart young man, nonverbal, autistic, but he got to his spelling board. And I want you just to listen to the conversation that they had there. Uh, the question that they asked Seth was this, what made you sad tonight? This is what they wrote out. Seth said, only my heart hurts for Jake. They asked him, why does your heart hurt for Jake? Seth said, he's in a wheelchair and can't hear. And so they asked him, why does that make you sad? And Seth said, he's not able to do. Well, so they ask him the question, do you think he is happy? Yes. Do you think he is loved? Yes. Do you think God thinks he's exactly the way he wanted him to be? And Seth said, yes. Why do you think God let some people be able not to do much? And Seth said, so others can help. And so they said to, to Seth, why is that a good thing? And Seth said, he gets glory. God gets glory. And so they asked him this question, do you know one person in this house that gets to give God glory because he helps Jake by pushing his wheelchair? And Seth said, me. And he goes on to say, Seth says, so my purpose is to help Jake and give God glory. That's a special needs adult. I'm not so convinced that these special need children don't have a keener insight into the glory of God than those of us who think we are normal. We give God glory when we care for each other. And when we give him glory by caring for each other, some of the glory that is going to be revealed splashes back down on us. Shepherd the flock of God among you. Go care for somebody. Let's stand. Now, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, we, we had a lady in the last service who, first time here, and I called for people to come down who needed prayer, and she came down. She'd lost her daughter not long ago. And in struggle, she came down to be prayed for. I want to pray for you. I'm not a perfect pastor. I can't get to everybody and to everything. I can't even remember like I used to. But I do love you, and I do care for you. And I go to God often and apologize to God for not being as good a shepherd as I should be. And I ask God to give me another day to be a better shepherd with you, to shepherd and care for you. But some of you are hurting today. You've got some deep hurts. You've got some private wounds and some private hurt. You've not shared with anybody. Can I pray for you? Would you come down right now? Would you just slip out, get here to an altar and give me the chance just to pray over you? I'm not going to ask you anything. I'm just going to pray for you. You say, I'm struggling. we got a difficult... Maybe it's a husband. Maybe a wife. Maybe a couple. Maybe a family. Maybe a young person. Maybe a senior adult. Just come. Just come to the altar. You know how to do that? Just slip out. Say, I, 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 I've got a difficulty I'm struggling with right now. Maybe financial, maybe sin. Maybe spiritual. Uh, maybe a child. It may be whatever. 
I have no idea. But I want you to come. I want to pray for you. I want to just pray over you. If you'll just come and kneel. Some have come. What about others? Would you be so bold as to slip out and say, I'm standing in the need of prayer. It's not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Maybe this morning you've never trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And what you've heard just moves you to say, I need to give my life to Christ. I need that kind of a a pastor. I need that kind of a Savior. I need that kind of an elder, the one who forgives me and loves me and has mercy and grace for me. Maybe this morning you say, I want to be a part of a church like that. I want to be in a church where a pastor actually loves the people. I want to be a part of a a church where they serve and they care for one another. And they don't do it for show. They don't do it for title. They do it because they're motivated by giving glory to God. That everything we do, every mission trip we take, every mission project we have, Every class that meets, every lesson that's taught, every sermon that's given, all of it is done for the glory of God, the glory of God. Not for us, but for you, O Lord. Not for us, but for you, O Lord. Lord, for these that are here, you're the great shepherd. You know their hearts. You know their struggles. You know their needs. Some are here interceding for others, praying for others. Some are here, Father, calling out for their own lives. I know you hear. I know you long to answer our prayers. I know you love us because you sent your son to die for us. I know that you're merciful and that you're tender and you're kind-hearted and you're long-suffering. Oh, what a marvelous Savior. Oh, Father, help us to emulate that one thing. And that is a willingness to serve others. So for these that are here, Father, pour your spirit on them. Be that balm of Gilead that soothes and heals May they be kept in perfect peace because their mind is stayed on you. For we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. I want you to know this. I love you. And many of you, I don't even know you, but I don't have to know you to love you because that is a determination of the will and not an emotional feeling. You matter to me.